All right, here we are. Welcome to the uh, Friday Q and A, which we do every so often. <laughs> it's kind of like every other Friday at the moment. Hopefully, we'll get back into every Friday once uh, I'm able to do that. But right now, our first question for today comes in um, with the following conundrum. It says, how do you reconcile the New Testament's clear teachings to love and pray for our enemies with Psalms like 69 verses 22 through 28? I'll get into that Psalm in a second. Is there ever a time when we should pray against our enemies? Now, Psalm 62 is one of what we call uh, an imprecatory Psalm. It's a Psalm that uh, imprecatory means like to, to bring a, a, a curse or, you know, bad consequences onto somebody. And so there's there's psalms, there's like seven or so, seven, eight of them that people will class as imprecatory psalms. This is one of them. And there's others where in the psalm, somewhere in the psalm, you know, there's 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 a statement where it's like asking for God to cause harm to someone. And yet Jesus said for us to pray for our enemies, bless those who curse us, um, you know, that we should, we love our enemies rather, bless those who curse us, pray for those who persecute us. So this is yeah, this is, this is a bit of a conundrum. Let's let's look at the passage, and I'm going to walk you guys through like a bunch of specifics on this, kind of a quick, uh, a short version of a primer on imprecatory psalms, and at least some answers that I think I have on these issues, um, that I think the scripture has on these issues that I'm aware of. And I'll leave you to further your research on your own. So let's look at the text. This is Psalm 69. After talking earlier in the psalm about a bunch of pain he's experienced and wrong that's been done to him, um, David then talks about those who are who are trying to destroy him, kill him, uh, make his children fatherless, that kind of thing. So it says, let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. So, you know, fear. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in their tents for they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Then there's probably the heaviest verse here. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a huge deal. That, to be blotted out of the book of the living here, this not be written with the righteous seems to be like eternal consequences. Um, so a few things I'll say about this passage, then I want to talk about like, just walk us through kind of a primer ways, at least that I think about these things and, and some others respond to them. Um, and you guys can think about it for yourself, learning to think biblically about everything. That's the goal here with the Bible thinker, this ministry. So in these verses, we have this, um, let their table become a snare for them. This is the things that they're enjoying, that they're delighting in, which, which are things, which I think you can say are implied. These things are achieved by sin. And it's their prosperity. Let that become a trap for them. Uh, God often in, in Proverbs, in Psalms, and in Scripture will trap people where the, the sin that they wanted, that they finally got, and that they thought was pleasure and joy, ends up being a curse to them. This is actually consistent with that. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. So this is God speaking of God, let your wrath you know, come upon them. This is actually quoted in the New Testament. Um so you can't just take the section of scripture and remove it and be like, well, that's no good for us. We just, we just think that one's wrong. This is what some progressive Christians will do. And they'll just say, yeah, these are just plain wrong. Uh, th these, these statements in the Psalms, um, they persecute the ones you've struck. Okay. So th this is actually, um, something that we get, like say in the book of a Amos, I believe it is, or, or, and it was Obadiah. I think it's Obadiah now. I'm trying to remember right now. Um, at any rate, this is where, you know, God strikes a, a, a people, say Israel or David for sin, and then others come and kick them while they're down and persecute them, even though they're being chastened by God, but forgiven because they're repenting. And then they try to take advantage of this. And so they're, they're like jackals or vultures in that context. So um, let's now look at some specifics. All right. Some people will say that such desires and prayers are always unchristian. They're bad for Christians. You, you simply cannot have these types of prayers, these types of desires, even that some God would blot someone out of the book of the of the book of life. Um, I think that this doesn't hold true to the New Testament. So, like if we see things like this in the New Testament or in Jesus's mouth, then we'll have to say that there's at least some room for it in some way. Now, I'm not saying open the floodgates. Pray hateful things all the time, you all all you want. But rather, what I'm saying is, we, we should at least say, hey, we can't have a wholesale 
do it whenever you want or throw it completely out if we see it actually in the New Testament as well. So Galatians 1, 9 is an example of this. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And this word accursed, anathema in the Greek, it really, in, the, in this context, he means accursed from God. He, blotted out of the book of life. Like this is, this is a parallel to that Old Testament statement there, blotted out of the book of life. Let them be accursed from God. And this is in the New Testament, specifically those who preach a false gospel, they deserve and should be blotted out of the book of life. Um, wow, that, that's a big deal. But there's, there's a lot more. Let me share with you some others that I think make it so that you can't rule these things out entirely. Galatians 5.11. Um, this is a, a, an adult type of verse here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something that adults can understand and go, oh, I get that. And like a 12-year-old would snicker at and, and miss the point. He says, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? The if, if then the offense of the cross had ceased, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Uh, that that idea, cut themselves off or emasculate themselves. These these are a, a mature moment here, right? Th these are um, Judaizers who were going to the Galatians, saying you have to be you have to be circumcised and become a Jew and obey the law in order to be saved. And Paul's rejecting this as a false gospel. And he and he actually says something that kind of sounds like the Psalms here. He goes, "I wish that they would, instead of circumcising you, I wish they would cut themselves off, figuratively and using the term literally in a sense." I mean, I don't know if he's, I don't think he means it. I think he's using a literal term here in a figurative sense to show I would rather them just harm themselves instead of harming you. Um, and that, that idea of being cut off is, has a lot of other symbolic meaning too, and with, with Israel. Anyway, that being said, this is kind of a similar thing. Very imprecatory ish. Is that a word? Probably not. All right. Second Timothy 414. This is where Paul says, um, Alexander, the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Okay. This is not a compliment. This is asking God to, to, it's kind of like the Psalms. Hey, God, do bad to them as they as they deserve. He's he's asking for this with Alexander. Now, if we read other places in Paul, we realize that Alexander was probably this guy um, that was had embraced the gospel, or at least apparently did, and then later apostatized, and then did much harm. He's a coppersmith, so he's probably making money with idols and stuff, possibly. At any rate, he 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 apostatized, and they did much harm, which could be persecution that he was bringing on Paul, um, if it's the same guy, um, or, you know, or trying to draw other Christians away, or it could just be that he was a different Alexander and he was the, uh, one of the people who's making idols who rages against Paul. Here's the gospel, his heart's hardened. You know, Paul wants him saved, but you know what? Because in this moment of him preaching the gospel, there's this attack against the gospel itself. Yes, Lord, repay him according to his works. This sounds very much like that too, but there's an even bigger, I think, usage in Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, where we, we read about the opening of the scrolls and, and the seals and the bold judgments and all this. So here it says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the souls of those who'd been slain for the, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice saying, and here's what those who'd been persecuted are saying. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Make no mistake about it. The judgment that they're talking about here in Revelation is like God's actual wrath poured out in violence upon the earth. And they're praying for it related to their enemies. What, what am I saying? Then you can't just pretend like imprecatory Psalms or ideas are only in the Old Testament before Christ and sort of draw a clean line away from Christians and, and, and these calls for judgment. And I think this is good. I think this sobers us up as Christians. God will judge and it is good. And you should recognize this. And if you don't recognize that God's judgment is good, there's something wrong in your, in your thinking about judgment in general. You either think sin is not as bad as it is, or God is not as holy as he is, or that justice is not as good as it is. There's, there's something wrong in your thinking here. Um, whatever it is, it's not biblical and it's not true. So there's like a sense of, of the goodness of God's judgment and his justice that he's going to bring one day. So then you could, you could even go to Jesus's woes, like where Jesus is like, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, 
sometimes we think of these as Jesus is mourning, like he mourns over Jerusalem, he weeps over Jerusalem. And that's true, but it's, it's both sides. It's not either or, it's both and. He weeps over Jerusalem and he threatens them with horrible judgment that he will bring. It's not either or, it's both. He weeps and he threatens. There's a desire for them to be saved. There's a desire for them to repent. And there's a, there's a reality of God's, the goodness of God's judgment upon those who won't. And I think the Bible holds both of these together. It's not just either or. So, um, um, so some will say that these prayers are bad for Christians to do. I think that you can't just make that claim when you look at the broad scope of the new Testament and you see that the types of like judgment that God is bringing and, and that it's good. Revelation six is to me a, a, a big deal there. Others say it's just them venting. It's just the psalmist are venting. And so we should take it with at least a grain of salt. Like maybe, maybe don't say that they're wrong. Okay. That I think is, is, is there's a problem with your view of inspiration at that point, but the, um, and, and your ability to interpret, a passage. <laughs> but, um, forgive me, I'm just being honest, but the, the idea that there, maybe there's a, an element of this where it's just them venting. Okay. I'm actually open to that because there's definitely Psalms where the Psalmist, if you read the whole Psalm, he says something silly in the beginning of the Psalm, like Psalm 73, and then towards the end of the Psalm, he corrects himself. So there was a clear instance of venting, pouring your heart out before God and getting out this wrong idea, but not letting it sit there and correcting it. Um, however, we don't generally see the type of thing where it's a correction going on in these imprecatory Psalms, at least not, not as a rule where it's across all of them. They're always like later going, ah, oh, I shouldn't have this bad attitude. So I think that you, yeah, you, 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 it's, it's, you'd be hard pressed to push that on all these, all these Psalms. Um, so let me give you some elements, some principles, and then we'll talk about how to apply this with, with Jesus's command to pray for our enemies. Um, one in the Psalms, it is not about revenge. Um, they appeal to God as judge and implicit in this. If you read the Psalms carefully, you, you realize implicit in this is the fact that the Psalmist will not try to get vengeance on their own. They're not even going to attempt to get vengeance on their own because God is the one who will avenge. So God is the judge and they're going to wait on God to do the judging. This is huge. This is you when you feel wounded and you want to strike back and you want to get in the flesh and you want to do evil things. If you instead pray, Lord, I pray you would be the judge and you would do justice and you would bring rightness into the situation. You would deal with them. And this is a, uh, a prayer of faith. It really is. Um, so it's not them getting revenge. Uh, number two, I think you can add an implicit, if they won't repent onto all the imprecatory Psalms. Why do I say this? Um, well, scripture is chock full, Old and New Testament, chock full of this idea of if you repent, God forgives. It's throughout the scripture. It's very strongly in both the Old and New Testament. I'll give you an Old Testament passage right here. Isaiah 55, one of my favorite Old Testament passages. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is the, the, the appeal. Come and repent. So let's suppose that the one who this imprecatory psalm is being prayed over repented. Well, that would change everything. Oh, well, in light of the grace of God, we, we, we see them being forgiven. So there's an element of that of where I could say, yeah, Lord, I pray that you would stop and smash this person in their sin but I pray also they would repent and they can then avoid your, your future coming judgment. Uh, there's an element of that where I think that can be prayed. And there's times where that feels like the right thing to pray, right? As when ISIS is running around and they're causing so much um, um, horrible massacres and stuff like that. Like that's an appropriate prayer. Lord, I don't just want you to prosper them in their, in their agendas here. <laughs> I pray you would smash them and bring them to repentance, Lord, um, that that. I think is an appropriate prayer at that point. It's difficult to find examples of this in your normal life because most of us aren't experiencing that kind of stuff, you know, where it's more like, um, my boss is always, he always overlooks me. He doesn't say thank you enough. And it's like, well, I'm not going to like pray an imprecatory psalm on it. Um, even Psalm 69 is actually a contrast to show you that there's this implied if they will repent. In Psalm 69, the one we were reading today, there's this contrast between David who was struck for sin, but repented, and now he's experiencing God's mercy, 
to the person uh, who's who's going to be blotted out or is requested to be blotted out. They're unrepentant. They don't yield to God. So we have sinners on both ends of the psalm. One's repentant, experiencing God's mercy. One's out of God's mercy. So this psalm stands as a reminder that if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't go to Jesus like with real faith and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I deserve your wrath and judgment. Then you're going to get the wrath and judgment. So this is a reminder of that very real judgment of God that's coming upon the world and upon each individual. Yeah, they need Jesus. Um, another thing I'll say, third element to think of with these imprecatory Psalms is you're not David. Um, let me give you an example from this. Okay, here's one that's, that I use in the thumbnail, breaking teeth. But um, Psalm chapter 41, look at verse, um, oh, I'm sorry, The break, I'll get the breaking teeth one in a second. That's Psalm 58, but... Um, here we go. In Psalm 41, 10, it says, but you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. This is probably the only one that I'm aware of anyways, where David or one of the Psalms is saying, I'll get him back, raise me up. And I'm going to, I'm going to get them. I mean, that just sounds like totally something. Whoa. I don't think I can pray that Mike. And you're right. You probably can't. Right. But imagine this, imagine if you were a police officer and there you are going out to a crime scene. And you get struck and hit and you're on the ground and there's the, 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 the criminals are out running amok and you're lying on the ground and you start praying, God, raise me up so I can get them. All of a sudden, it takes a whole different connotation. It's not about personal revenge because you represent the law and you do need to get up and get them. David is the king of Israel here. He's the one who's supposed to rise up and bring justice down in the world, in, in at least Israel, right? He's also a picture of Jesus who God raises up and now we're waiting until Jesus comes back for those who don't repent to get them like that. And that's a good thing. So, um, yeah, you're not David. So that's why you wouldn't pray Psalm 41 10. Cause you know, if you're, you're that cop, <laughs> yeah, you could pray it. That's good in that scenario. Cause it's assigned to a rightful authority to bring out the sword, so to speak. Um, so you're not David. You can't always personalize every scripture that you see. That's not a good for you to try to do that. And finally, I'll say Psalms tell a story. Um, I say finally, but I'm not there yet, actually. Uh, Psalms tell a story. And in the book of Psalms, you, you can't just read a verse and pull it out. You, you do need to read the entire flow of the whole chapter in order to find it. This is why you have to take them individually. I, you can't take something I've said and apply it to every single imprecatory Psalm. You need to look at each one in context thoughtfully. And let me give you an example of this. Here's a Psalm that's, I don't know if it's really even very imprecatory. I mean, it sort of is, but people think it is a lot more than it is. And here's the thing that you always get quoted, right? You, you get this, this, um, uh, this statement, break their teeth in their mouth, Lord, break their teeth in their mouth. Oh God. And, and I'm okay. So in, in a, in a culture where we we're, we're very aware of fights and, and UFC and boxing and all this stuff. So break their teeth in their mouth just sounds like literally God, I want you to smash their face so hard that their teeth fall out. But this is not literal, right? Look at the rest of the verse. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. In the Psalms, when they when they turn people into animals, so to speak, they, they say, hey, I'm going to talk about a person like they're an animal or a creature. It's to illustrate specific realities about them. So in this case, the young lion is, uh, they have teeth. These are their weapons. Break their teeth in their mouth means ruin their ability to kill people. So if a lion had no teeth, it just gum people. <laughs> so that's the idea. And to, to make this clear, let's look at the next verse where it says, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces, right? When he bends his bow. So he bends his bow to like strike somebody and, and his arrows just fall in half, right? Where his teeth are like the arrows as well. The idea is that their ability to harm people is removed. God ruin their ability to hurt people. May their guns malfunction. Well, <laughs> like that's, that's the idea. So really, this is, this is not, um, uh, what people often think of it as, it's just, just, I just want to see violence upon them, just violence, violence. And I'm not saying you can answer every Psalm that way, but here's one example of one where you have to take them individually, consider them thoughtfully, do a whole Bible study on the entire chapter and not just read a verse. So here's some general rules. Um, prayer for justice is appropriate and it's just, and it's okay to be like, God, you will one day judge them. And I'm happy about that. But we're also called to demonstrate an overabundance of grace as a way of showing people the gospel. Now, the, the gospel was not fully revealed in the Old Testament. It is fully revealed now. 
and you are an ambassador of that gospel. And while David stood and the Israelites stood as a national kingdom that God had created and was doing something special with, now Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And we read, our, our, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And this changes a lot of how we deal with sort of those situations. Because David wouldn't say, "I'm you know, raise me up so I can repay them if he wasn't the king of Israel in Old Testament Israel. Right? Paul's not going to say that. Lord, raise me up so I can repay them because he's in a, he's in a different scenario. So for us, I think that we pray for them and we bless them and we seek for benefits and blessings upon those who are even hurting us, who deserve judgment, not because that is what is just, but because that is what shows God's overabundant grace. I will demonstrate undeserved kindness and mercy towards others as a way of showing you what the gospel means. This is why you can pray, rightfully pray for God to judge them. That's that's not wrong in and of itself. But you can also, as an ambassador for the gospel, say, even though I could rightfully pray for that, I'm going to pray for their repentance. I'm going to pray for them to receive mercy. So th this is where you get um, Romans 12. Here's another passage in the New Testament that holds these things in, in I don't want to say intention. A lot of weirdos use that word too much. <laughs> No, there's a long story, but um, they hold, hold these tr these different truths together, right, in balance, in proper balance, so that we can understand them. Here's a verse, that, a passage that does this. Romans 17, repay no one evil for evil, so you don't get vengeance. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But it doesn't end there, right? This is where the pacif go. pacifist would be like, don't avenge yourself. That's the end of the story. But here it's rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. And here's a promise. I will repay, says the Lord. So God is saying to us, I am going to bring payment. Don't get in the way. You hold back and just show mercy, mercy, mercy. But Lord, what if I keep showing mercy and they never repent? What if I keep showing kindness and they, they die in their sin and they just get worse? Well, read the next verse. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you heap... You will heap coals of fire on his head. I tend to think this does mean it'll increase their judgment. If the enemy doesn't repent, then it will only add to their sin total because they've received even more kindness and even more light and even more grace that they've rejected. So one way or another, God's going to be glorified in bringing justice and judgment on the wicked. Or what our hope is and what God's gospel shows us is that he'd, he'd like to prefer to bring them into the grace of Christ. And you can be an ambassador to bring that build that bridge by not um, jumping to the imprecatory <laughs> attitude um, too quickly or too much or too wrongly. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the other danger of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm imprecatorying now. There's another not word for you. So, um, so yeah, uh, pray for, pray for them. Um, pray for them to repent. You can still pray for God to stop them. You can pray that God will judge, that God please judge them if they don't repent. But that's me trusting him to do the judgment. And I think that's a good thing. And you can say also, God, this is me refusing to be overcome by evil, choosing to wait and to trust on your good judgment. I will not take a sinful action in this situation. I will call on you and I will wait. I hope that that brings some answers to you guys um on that on that question we got a, t a ton of questions we're gonna be dealing with today so let's just plow into them i spent a little longer on the first one as usual